Destination, freedom. Listen, it's the freedom bell. Aye, the freedom bell, my friend. And this is Paul Revere, called back from the shadows by the sound of the freedom bell to cry again a warning that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Destination Freedom is presented by station WMAQ in the interest of human freedom the world over. Paul Revere is a symbol of warning, ready to ride down the skies to shout his alarm. His destination now and forever, freedom. December 10th, 1950. Human Rights Day. Dedicated to the proposition that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Aye. And that's what we built our nation on. An independent nation of free men, the first in the world. And then we discovered that not all men wanted their brother men to be free. Wars have been fought to preserve our freedom and to keep the freedom of other men in other nations. It's been an uphill battle all the way. A battle that continues even today. But tell me, have you ever heard of the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798? Perhaps it is a universal truth that the loss of liberty at home is to be charged to provisions against danger, real or pretended, from abroad. Most outspoken victim and critic of the act was Matthew Lyon of Vermont. Aye, the Alien and Sedition Act, the result of political conspiracy by a party controlling our government, but grown too powerful and too smug, using laws as instruments to serve their own selfish motives. It was wrong, and it did not last, as all things do not last which are not morally sound. Freedom-loving men rose up to destroy the Alien and Sedition Act, and another battle for freedom was won. This is the way it happened in 1798. Life certainly took on a new complexion the day I married Matthew Lyon. The governor's home was packed with friends, and my father, Governor Chittenden, was quite a hand at marrying people. It was a beautiful wedding, nonetheless. I was a widow, and Matthew a widower, with four children. After the ceremony, the six of us left for Fairhaven, Vermont, a bustling little town that Matthew helped build from the ground up, and <laughs> more wind-blown than blushing, my husky Irish groom whisked me across the threshold right into a house full of guests. There you go, my pretty girl. Now, how about the kids for all this? Oh, Matthew, no, not in front of me. Come on. <laughs> there, how's that for a start? Oh, wonderful, darling. Let's do it again. <laughs> By the two bulls that redeemed me, that's how it's done in Ireland, too. <laughs> that was his favorite expression, by the two bulls that redeemed me. I knew the fierce pride that welled up inside him when he uttered those words, and little did I know that they were destined to become famous words in the Congress of the United States. After the gay round of parties, I finally managed to organize things a little and find out what a powerhouse I'd married. Among other things Matthew owned was a sawmill. Beulah, come over here. I want you to see something. What is it, Matthew? Feel this paper, darling. Just feel it. Matthew, what is it? I've never seen a paper like this before. It's basswood, darling. Basswood. Oh, they said it wouldn't work, but Matthew Lyon said it would. Well, here it is. Oh, Matthew. Matthew, it's so noisy in here, and I have some news for you. Can't we go outside? Hi, right, darling. How's we go? No, little darling. What's the news? Matthew, they want you to run. Run? Well, run where? Oh, no, Matthew. Not that kind of running. It's for congressmen. Oh, go on with you, girl. What would a hot-blooded Irishman be doing running for Congress? Oh, please, Matthew. You know you fought for states, right? And the people know you. Ah, but my business is Beulah. Who will oversee the lumber mills and the magazine? It isn't as though you'd be gone forever. Surely there are men you can trust. Trust and go bust. It's just like the present state of the nation. Some fools put their trust in the Federalists, and now look what's happened. Who wants to get mixed up with those nincompoops? 
But the people had their way in the fall elections of 1796, and Matthew and I left for Philadelphia the following May. We found rooms that pleased us after a weary day's search, and I was busy unpacking our trunks when Matthew, who'd gone out for the paper, finally returned. He was irritated by something. By the two bulls that redeemed me. Matthew, Matthew, what's the matter? You, you're all red in the face. Sit down now. Hi, Mrs. Lyon. And while we were looking for a place to rest our weary bones, the landlords were laughing at us and shaking their moth-eaten noggins. The Federalist mongrels. Matthew Lyon, what's the matter with you? Here, read this. But Peter Porcupine's gazette. Read what it says. The Lion of Vermont. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock will be exposed to public view. Lion of Vermont. Matthew, the, well, this is terrible. Go on, read it all. Um... This singular animal was said to have been caught in a bog of Hibernia and when a whelp transported to America. Curiously, he induced a New Yorker to buy him, and moving into the country afterwards, the New Yorker exchanged him for a yoke of young bulls. He was petted in the neighborhood of Governor Chittenden and soon became so domesticated that a daughter of His Excellency would pet him and play with him as a monkey. He differs considerably from the African lion is much more clamorous and less magnanimous. Well, there's more. I've read enough, thank you. Matthew, if that's the best literature the Federalist Party can put on the new stand, it's about time somebody did a little house cleaning. Who is this Peter Porcupine, anyway? Now, darling, don't get so upset. Peter Porcupine is an old Tory turned Federalist. He's a British citizen and the spokesman of the Federalist Party. But, Matthew, how can he get away with this tripe? Freedom of the press is a very dear thing, Beulah. Even though he's the citizen of another country. He's entitled to speak his piece in American newsprint. Well, I want you to promise me one thing, Matthew Lyon. And what might that be, sweetheart? That you'll fight back. <laughs> well, Mrs. Lyon, I think that can be arranged. Congress opened with unusual pomp and ceremony as President Adams gave his inaugural address. Matthew was sworn in amid jeers and howls from Federalists all over the floor of the house. Amid all the hostility, I remained in the background and acted like a curiosity seeker. One day, I think it was on the 2nd of June, I slept later than usual and arrived at the Capitol during the mid-morning. I think a motion will be made today about the speech, Adam. Yes, indeed, sir. A brilliant speech it was, too, sir. It is customary to retire to the President's chamber to congratulate him. Which he justly deserves, sir. It'll be mere routine, of course. Well, <laughs> maybe. I say, what do you mean by that? There's a newcomer in the House who seems to object to some of the accepted procedures. You mean the lion of a monk? <laughs> <laughs> He'll make no trouble, I assure you of that. Oh, well, I wish I were sure. <laughs> I say, I wonder what all that racket is. Wait, I'm going to take a look. Uh, beat the porcupine, I'll take care of that rascal lion. On what a roast thing you got a couple of days ago, to read it. Oh, indeed I did. Bill Cobbett is satire's great master. <laughs> there isn't that racket in the house. Uh, I wonder what you are... yes. Come here, come here. We can't miss this. Uh, what's going on? The lion of Vermont is crouching and bearing his face. Something involving Matthew was going on inside that chamber. And I sprang to my feet and ran to the door. Shouting was louder than I expected, and I squeezed past the three men who were listening at the door. Let me through. Please, please, let me through. The house will please come to order. Gentlemen, I don't wish to have to remind you that this is the Congress, and the chair has reluctantly recognized the delegate from Vermont. You may proceed, Mr. Lyon. Once again, Mr. Speaker... I am deeply grateful for your good offices. I should like to repeat to this assembly what I said yesterday about the discussion of answering President Adams' speech. Yesterday, gentlemen, I said that such members as do not choose to attend upon the president to present their answers to his speech should be excused. No. Today, I make a motion that those who do not wish to be present at the president's chambers be excused. No. I think this motion is reasonable. It leaves us at liberty to come and go as we see fit. Now, by the rules, I am obliged to attend. But I've been told that were I not to attend, I wouldn't be missed. 
but I'm a timid soul. <laughs> and the house has laws about this sort of thing, which reminds me of the reprimand this body gave to one Mr. Whitney. The representative from Vermont is out of order. Mr. Speaker! Mr. Speaker! Will the representative from Vermont yield to Mr. Allen? Temporarily, yes. Mr. Speaker, it pains me to say this, but I dislike men with Irish droves flung upon these shores from Europe meddling with affairs that are none of their business. And I think there's enough American blood in this house to defeat Mr. Lyons. No, yes, sir. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And now, Mr. Lyons, are you quite finished? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I don't ask that the rule be rescinded, nor do I object to gentlemen of high blood carrying this address. I have no pretensions to high blood. But I have as good blood as any of you. My mother was a fine, hale, healthy woman. I'm getting the lion's share of the applause. Thank you, Mrs. Lyon. Before yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I had never heard of gentlemen boasting of their blood in this house. I want to say, however, this is my country because I have no other. I own a share in it which I have bought by means of honest industry, and I have fought for it. In every day of trouble, I repaired to her standard and conquered under it. Conquest led my country to independence, and being independent, I call no man's blood in question. And that was Matthew's maiden speech in Congress. He made many friends that day, and many bitter, ruthless enemies. To President Adams and his Federalist High Command, it was a slap in the face. Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, and James Madison, three men who later became presidents of our country, each congratulated Matthew. Oh, I almost forgot to say that the House voted unanimously to excuse Matthew from having to appear before President Adams. Meanwhile, other events were taking form behind the scenes. A group of Federalists had gathered to discuss Matthew's speech. Uh, Gentlemen, uh, Mr. Adams is just outside the room. Will you rise when he enters? Welcome, Mr. Adams. I have taken this liberty to call upon a select group of our supporters. Do you know them all? Yes, I know them well. Mr. Griswold, Mr. Sewell, Hopper, Miss Shield, please. Go ahead, baby. Uh, Mr. Adams, my friend Griswold has told me a story about Mr. Lyon that will reveal a plan through which Mr. Lyon might be returned to his constituents in Ireland. Mm, most interesting, Mr. Dayton. What is the story, Griswold? Mr. President, it is not a matter of record, but common knowledge that Mr. Lyon was cashiered out of the army during the Northern Campaign. And it's been rumored that General Gates ordered Matthew Lyon to wear a wooden sword while being drummed out of camp to the music of the March of the Road. I also know that this sword incident is a very touchy point where Mr. Lyon is concerned. It would make excellent political material and, of course, discredit him on the floor of Congress. Well, go on, Mr. Griswold. Go on. All right. All right. The chair recognizes the Honorable Mr. Griswold. Speaker, gentlemen of the Congress. I would like to apprise you of the sentiments of a foreigner in our midst. You all know this person. He was bailed out of servitude by a couple of young bulls. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that the subject of my home state came under the scrutiny of this Irishman, who said that he could, with the aid of the press, go single-handedly into Connecticut and, through an expose, oust the entire Federalist Party within a few days. What do you think of that? Oh. I would like to ask the man who makes this pretense whether he will go armed with a wooden sword girding this loin perhaps. <laughs> the representative from Vermont seems to be preoccupied. I should approach him and whisper loudly in his better ear. I repeat, sir, would you be wearing a wooden sword? What, what happened? What happened? Uh, lion sticking Griswold's face. <laughs> there goes Bill Cobbett dashing out through the door. Peter Porcupine, me thinks he's about to splatter rink in this street. Philadelphia was in an uproar, and Peter Porcupine's gazette hit the stands merciless in his attack on Matthew. The story of the wooden sword had been a lie from the first, but the press and the public ate it up. 
Almost two weeks to the day after the first scene on the floor of the house, another far more serious act was provoked. Again, Mr. Griswold and my husband were involved. I say, Gordon, nothing exciting lately. How about joining me for a wee nip? Uh, yes, I think I could go for something about now. I'd as soon take the afternoon off, but they want a quorum on a new resolution. Oh? There may be some opposition, you know. Okay. Say, oh, Here's look, Gordon. Now. Here oh. comes Griswold. By George, he's carrying a big yellow cane under his arm. Look at the size of that, will you? I wonder where he's going with that thing. He's heading over to Lyon. Oh, let's stay here a moment. Griswold's grabbing that cane like a club. Oh, Lyon hasn't seen him yet. That's going to be a fight. Oh, Griswold's raising his cane. Hey, say, look, there's a fight over there. Oh, for heaven's sake, Lyon. Lyon's trying to get to his feet. Oh, Mr. Bell, God, what a beating Griswold's giving him. You dirty, miserable, cowardly soul. Kicking a man when his back is turned. Why, the two fools have received me. You'll pay for this great work. Kick my face. Will you handle the Connecticut Tory? Take this. And this is just for good measure. This. Father, rest me and stand off. I'll fight my own back. I'll be so sick. Stop this outrage. This is the Congress of the United States. Not a fool's hell. All right, all right. Let's have order here. Let's have order. Mr. Lyon, cease your attack upon the person of Mr. Griswold. Mr. Lyon! Mr. Speaker! The chair recognizes the Honorable Mr. Gordon. I move that Mr. Lyon, a member of this House, for violent attack and gross indecency committed on the person of Roger Griswold, be here with this bill. I second that motion, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the box of Pandora never let loose demons like those which plagued us in the days to follow. It was as though Matthew had loosed all the abuse inherent in mankind, and it descended upon him like the trials and tribulations of Job. But more than that, it gave birth to a thought that blossomed into the smelliest legislation ever to disgrace the statutes. For shortly afterwards, certain bills were introduced and debated, and over the protests of freedom-loving men, including many Federalists, the bills were passed. Their title, the Alien and Sedition Act. Under the Sedition Act, five years' imprisonment and $5,000 fine awaited any person who opposed governmental measures, resisted the law, or issued any so-called false, scandalous, or malicious writings against the President or the government. Then Congress adjourned, and the legislators went home to make their excuses and get on the ballot again. Ethan Allen and some friends came to see us shortly after we returned to Vermont. Ethan, I don't like it. That alien act is the foxiest piece of skullduggery ever put over on the American people. Well, none of us like it, Matthew. But how can you fight it without breaking the law? It can't be done. Well, anyway, Matthew, you'll be running again. Not if I can help it, Mr. Oh, uh, yes, that's one thing I forgot to mention, Ethan. Uh, hmm. Beulah doesn't want any parts of Philadelphia. <laughs> well, I can see why, Mrs. Lyon, but we need Matthew down there. I don't care, Mr. Allen. I think he could accomplish just as much for the country by just staying in Vermont. I'm sick of the whole mess. Did you tell Mr. Allen about the newspaper, Matthew? Oh, something new, Matthew? Well, uh, Ethan, I've been thinking of starting up a small paper. So people can read the truth for a change. Well, Matthew, why not? It's a splendid idea. Oh, they'll nab you for sedition. <laughs> I'm not worried about that, Ethan. Well, then what's to stop you, Matthew? Time, Ethan. Time. One just doesn't set up a paper overnight, you know. It takes money, men, circulation. Well... While you two are so busily engaged in Blarney, <laughs> I'll skip out and pour more cider for the guests. Will you have some, Mr. Allen? I certainly will, ma'am. Matthew? Huh? Oh, oh yes, 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 Bueller, whenever you get around to it. Uh, now, let's see, we, we have the newsprint, don't need too much equipment, and if we got going now... Church of Aristocracy and Repository of Important Political Truth. Hmm, 36 pages and only $3 a year. Guess I'll take one home. As it is the writer's belief that the nation would fare better without such a president as Adams has shown himself to be, a man with an unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and selfish avarice. Wait until Nate Chipman sees this. I thought it was in the best interest of the party, Mr. President. Where did you get hold of this magazine, Mr. Griswold? Through Senator Chipman, Your Excellency. It is a direct violation of the Sedition Act. Of course it is. This is a fine piece of work, Griswold. On your way out, summon the secretary and tell him to bring in a warrant. I'll have Lyon arrested myself. Matthew's magazine appeared on the 1st of October, 1798. The circulation was excellent and orders poured in for more and more copies. Three nights after the first issue appeared, Matthew arrived home later than usual. He was in high spirits. Why the two Is that you, Matthew? 
And are you expecting another man this time of the evening, Mrs. <laughs> Lyons? Oh, no, of course not, darling. Come over and tell me what went on at the wood factory today. Orders, orders, and more orders. Oh, the people are hungry for the truth, Matthew. And it's the truth that they'll be getting to, my darling. The whole of the Federalist hierarchy will feel the bite of Vermont's lion come the next issue. Aye, they'll be counting lions jumping their political fences while they're tossing in their beds at night. Oh, goodness. See who's at the door, Matthew. No, I hope it isn't more orders, that's all. Yes? As you lie. Oh, Mr. Fitch. I have a warrant for your arrest. Go on with you, Fitch. No, you'll not be pulling my leg at this time of night. Who is it, Matthew? It's Fitch, the marshal. Well, what does he want? Uh, I have an invitation to spend the night at the lockup with the marshal. At the lockup? You mean go to jail? Come on, Lyon, let's go. Hold on a minute, Marshal. Now, a joke's a joke. But if you're serious about this thing, I'll show up in the morning. After all, I'm not planning to go anywhere for a while except to the polls. And when we get through with that pleasantry, this warrant will be a forgery. Lyon, I... I... beg your pardon, Marshal Fitch. On my word of honor as a gentleman, I'll be there at any hour you say tomorrow. Well... Just say when. All right. There'll be a recess around noon. Fine. I'll be there. Always... Did like recesses. Good night, Marshal. Good riddance. All the impudent, conniving rascals. Matthew, what do you think they'll do? Beulah, we're not worrying our heads about it tonight. Come on, let's drink some tea and retire to the comforts of a warm blanket. The bed I sleep on tomorrow night may be a mite cool. The jury and the judge were Federalists to a man. The trial was a disgrace to our legal system. Matthew was convicted on three counts, all violations of the Sedition Act. He was sentenced to four months' imprisonment and $1,000 plus costs and hustled off to a dirty little jail in Virgin, 40 miles away from Fairhaven. It all happened so fast there was no time to get competent legal advice, but once the word got around, things began to happen, and the Green Mountain Boys, with Ethan Allen riding at their head, descended upon Virgin. <laughs> And they swept Matthew back into Congress by a staggering majority. He polled twice as many votes as all the other candidates combined, and him still in jail. As his four months rolled by, so much happened. There was the petition Mr. Ogden took to President Adams, and on it, 5,000 names. President Adams refused to honor the petition. There was a frenzy of correspondence between Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and many other liberals about Matthew's predicament. Then the subject of the $1,000 fine came up, and I just didn't know where to turn. But the whole family went to Virgin anyway on the morning Matthew's term was ended. As we approached the jail, I saw a large crowd. It was snowing. The crowd was excited. They'd left a path for our sleigh to the jail door, and we passed hundreds of slaves before we finally came to a halt. Fitch was unlocking the main door, and nearby some Federalist officials were huddling in a group. Your oh, time's up, Lyon. Now all you need to get out is $1,000 fine and $60 for cost. Oh, Matthew, Matthew. Now, now, Mrs. Lyon, no crying. You'll not be leaving here without it, Lyon. I think we'll attend to that, Marshal. I'm the governor of Virginia. General Mason, what are you doing up in the woods? Somebody in Philadelphia said Congress was looking for jailbirds. I just knew I'd find one if I beat the brush in Vermont long enough. You paying this man's fine, Governor? Yes, I am. And it's General Mason to you, sir. Very well, General Mason. Is this in paper currency? Yes, if you wish. Well, General, I'm sorry. It was recently decided that Mr. Lyon's fine must be paid in hard money. Well, I knew you'd say that. That's why I brought these bags. Uh, Release the prisoner, Marshal. These sacks contain $1,060 in gold specie. My aide will watch you count it. All right, you're a free man, Lion. Not so fast, Lion. Now what? I have a warrant for your arrest. I'm a marshal of the United States government. Really? 
And a typical staunch supporter of the Federalist administration, too, I'll wager. Now, how would you know that, Mr. Lyon? You dunderheads are all alike. <laughs> Be a good fellow and run along back to Philadelphia. And when you get there, you tell Adams that if he read the Constitution once in a while, he'd find out that a representative is immune to arrest during a session of Congress. And now, if you'll just pardon me, I'll jump into my sleigh and kiss the finest, prettiest girl in Vermont. <laughs> After we thanked General Mason, Matthew drove toward Philadelphia at the head of the longest parade the country had ever seen. Plays stretched out behind us, 12 miles in length. Yes, I cried like a baby. But Matthew had a score to settle, and he had his chance during the deadlock over Jefferson in the Electoral College. The election was carried to the House, and the House vote was a tie. That was before Matthew arrived. He cast his vote and the Federalist Party crumbled to the dust and mingled with the dirt it was. It never revived. A great victory for freedom, won by common men with a great weapon, the vote. That's the only way to fight oppression. The way to keep freedom secure in America. Aye, and we have another job. To spread human rights to all men the world over. For no man is free if any other man is enslaved. Each day throughout the year should be Human Rights Day in your heart. For it's there the battle must begin. How will the battle be won? Listen to Douglas H. Schneider, head of the Mass Communications Department of UNESCO. In Paris and in Havana, in Chicago and in New Delhi, we are commemorating today the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations two years ago. Today we recall the first words of that declaration. Recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, La Déclaration des Droits de l'Homme et du Citoyen and the United Nations Universal Declaration, these are great landmarks in man's long struggle to attain the full dignity of his estate. But documents, noble and inspired as they may be, will remain mere pieces of parchment until the concept of human rights flourishes in the heart and mind of every man, woman and child. UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, cooperating with the United Nations, is pledged to spread knowledge of the Declaration. And this we can do with the help of the great voices of public information, radio, the film, the press. But the achievement of those rights depends on the personal effort of all men of goodwill everywhere. It's in our own towns, our own offices, our own homes that we must transform into daily living truth these words of the Declaration. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Paul Revere, portrayed by Maurice Copeland, will return next Sunday to narrate the next chapter in the story we call Destination Freedom. Presented by station WMAQ in the interest of human freedom the world over. Today's script was written by Bob Eklund and produced under the direction of John Collins. Beulah was played by Geraldine Kay and Donald Gallagher was Matthew Lyon. Others in the cast were Dean Almquist, Jack Lester and Russell Reed. Mr. Schneider's speech was transcribed. The special music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and played by Helen Morton and Jose Bethencourt. Our engineer was George Wilson, sound effect by Cliff Mueller. Now this is Charles Mountain reminding you the sound of the Freedom Bell is your invitation to follow Paul Revere along the road to destination freedom. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.